So yes, I'm going to talk about the fair data principles, and I have several disclosures to make. One, my conflict of interest office makes me say that I am, in fact, a CSO of a startup company it's called SciCrunch that is actually creating tools and services around something called the Research Resource Identifier, which I won't talk about too much today, but you'll see reference to it. My second disclosure is that uh, I am not a neuroimager, although I hang out with neuroimagers a lot. <laughs> my background is in neuroanatomy, but uh, definitely microscopy and uh, uh, microscopic data, light and electron microscopy. Um, and my uh, third disclaimer is I'm not a programmer either. I've spent my entire career trying to be the interface between the programmers. You can't hear me? Oh. I've spent most of my career trying to be the interface between the biomedical scientists and the computer scientists who've been trying to do things with uh, their data. Uh, but um, I won't say that I've remained deliberately ignorant of coding, uh, but it is not something that I do. So I just wanted to give you those disclaimers before uh, we started. Uh, but one thing that I have worked on a lot is uh, information retrieval and search for neuroscience. So I was the PI of a project that still exists called the Neuroscience Information Framework that was actually started back in 2008, which used to not seem a long time ago, but actually is uh, getting to be quite a long time ago. And this was in this pivotal period when neuroscientists all of a sudden uh, were funded to produce a lot of digital resources, a lot of databases, a lot of tools, and a lot of other things. And at the time, nobody really knew how many of these things existed, and nobody really uh, knew how to build them in a way that might make it easier for us to find out how many of these things existed. So NIF has actually been uh, cataloging these resources since about 2000 and, uh, 2008. We have about 15,000 of them that we track across biomedicine. Uh, and we saw firsthand the things that people did when they produced these data resources, which made it harder for other people to A, find them and also use them. And in fact, NIF back in 2010 uh, issued a variant of the FAIR principles <laughs> saying this is really what you need to do if you're going to produce data resources for the web. The second thing that I spent a lot of time doing since about 2012 was working through an organization called Force 11, which stands for the Future of Research Communications and e-scholarship. This was launched at a meeting in uh, 2011 that was held at UCSD that was called Beyond the PDF. And it was a group of uh, basically a grassroots organization who said, you know what, we really shouldn't be publishing things in this way. We really should be doing things different. We have new technologies that, that are available to us. We have, as we found out soon thereafter, problems in reproducible science, and there's a better way for us to do this. Um, what was interesting about this community was it sort of brought together groups that traditionally hadn't spoken to each other very much, and that included the library scientists and the scholars researchers, the publishers and the scholars researchers. We were used to viewing each other as customers, uh, but not really as colleagues, and it was very interesting actually to be able to uh, learn their perspectives, and as you'll see, it very much has informed uh, the FAIR principles and a lot of things that I'll talk about today. So one of the big changes that has happened over that time is this idea that data is not the detritus of science, as that was often called before, or a byproduct of science, but that it was a primary product of science. And in fact, as you saw in the earlier uh, talks, and you know in the, uh, the age of big data and the big e-science institutes, in fact, it may be the most important product of our research is our data, not the conclusions that we draw from them, because we're often limited in what we can study, but the fact that we produce data that then can be reused for another purpose and aggregated and integrated may be the most important thing that we do. So we started uh, in Force 11, actually, back in 2014, starting to work on something called data citation, which says if we have a system of citation for papers, we ought to have the same system of citation for data sets and consider them a primary product of research. So uh, this was started in 2014, and five years later, we're happy to <laughs> report that actually all of the major publishers have signed on to data citation. Uh, there were three or four uh, roadmap papers that were produced by uh, my colleagues and I in Force 11 that says, well, one ought to be able to do this, right? One ought to be able to receive credit. And now, basically, there's nothing standing in the way of people, if they do publish their data, of getting credit, just like anything else. But why did that take five years? <laughs> it took five years, first 
of all, because you had to have the community agreements that this was a good thing to do. You had to understand what a data citation comprises. And more importantly, you had to build the infrastructure to allow that to happen. And even though it might seem something simple conceptually, new standards had to be developed for NLM. The, the publishers had to change the way that they considered an author and what they considered author. It was actually a fairly complicated thing, much to our surprise. So change, basically, even though we can envision something, oftentimes the change that we seek actually requires a period to gain the community agreements and also to build the infrastructure to allow that to be possible. And that, again, will be a continuing theme of this talk. So why is it that we want to do this? Um, when those of us who write papers in favor of data sharing, uh, we still get pushback from a lot of people as to why one would want to do this. And one of the common pushbacks is that, well, we already do meta-analysis. We already look at effect sizes. We don't really need any of this. And I think Russ already showed that just because you get effect sizes does not mean <laughs> that you can analyze them. But in response to a critique of a paper that I wrote, I actually did a little uh, uh, research on meta-analysis and came across this very interesting interesting set of quotes from Jean Glass, who was one of the father uh, of meta-analysis. He wrote a white paper uh, in the year 2000, and he basically said, meta-analysis was created out of the need to extract useful information from the cryptic records of inferential data analyses in the abbreviated reports and research in journals. Meta-analysis needs to be replaced by archives of raw data that can permit the construction of complex landscapes that depict relationships amongst independent, dependent, and mediating variables. So it was always considered to be just the best we could do at the time. But now that we have more infrastructure, more need, more drive to make data available, we can and we should be able to do better. The other thing is you hear a lot about big data and you hear about long tail data or these, these individual studies that tend to be produced. We heard about a lot of them in the last talk. And Big data, of course, is all the rage. You hear a lot of people, especially in the human genetics community, if I don't have 20,000 subjects, sorry, don't even bother to talk to me. But we all know, especially those who work in animals, but all of us who are still working, that getting 20,000 subjects, as Russ said, is not that easy. Right? I mean, it is not that easy to be funded for that. That puts a hard cap and limit on the type of science we can do. But my colleague Neil McKenna has this lovely quote that said, small data done right are big data. That is, if we in fact can figure out how to report things reasonably, if we understand what the sources of variability are, it is possible for us to be able to aggregate data and do analyses across much larger sample sizes than we would be able to do otherwise. And there's been some good examples of that. I think Russ showed some, but also in other fields like spinal cord injury, they've shown the power of being able to concatenate together all of these small data sets to drive discovery science in a much more uh, reasonable way. So the question then becomes is how do we share data in a form that allows us to use data beyond the lifetime of a study and how do we share data in a form that allows us to more easily combine data across studies. So that's where the FAIR data principles come in. And these were a set of principles that were issued actually around 2015. They were posted on Force 11, uh, but the paper came out in 2016 that called for uh, the FAIR guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. And the essence of this, with this very, very catchy acronym, is that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. In other words, it should be FAIR. And that the FAIR principles are directed not just towards other humans being able to understand what it is that you have done, but also to create things in machine processable and actionable ways such that computers would be able to perform some of the same operations that a human being might be able to perform. So FAIR is great. And as everybody said, everybody wants to be FAIR. Um, who doesn't want to be FAIR? As uh, I said in a talk the other day, it's like mom and apple pie, right? Nobody doesn't want to be FAIR. It's just, what do I do and how much is it going to cost me becomes the question. So at a high level, the FAIR principles are characteristics that contemporary data resources, tools, vocabularies, and infrastructures, you see that I'm extending FAIR beyond just data, that should exhibit 
to, should exhibit to assist discovery and reuse by third parties. And there's been a lot of groups that have uh, bought into this. The European Union in particular has a lot of activities around FAIR, but even economically, you see the, um, the G20 actually adopted and put a statement there saying, yes, we should be able to produce FAIR data. So it's not just um, about science, but in some fact, general principles for what one does. It's important to remember, however, that uh, as I talk to you, that there are several things that the FAIR principles are not. One of them is they're not a standard, they are a set of principles. As you'll see, the FAIR principles tell you what you should aspire to, they do not tell you how to do that. Okay? They leave a lot up to the community as to how to interpret it. Even though the main authors of the FAIR principles were big in the semantic web, and how many people know what the semantic web RDF is? Okay, very few. <laughs> so this was a, a, a proposal. Uh, you know, Satra's around here somewhere, and I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about this, uh, by Tim Berners-Lee, one of the, the architects and fathers of the internet, that says we ought to be able to have a web of data. And uh, this proposal was floated in the 1990s, actually, and there was a, a language that was uh, put behind it called Resource Description Framework, or RDF, and there were various implementations called Link Data and the Semantic Web. These were basically these large semantic graphs which used uh, formal representations of knowledge representations to create relationships amongst uh, data elements and the type of things that uh, metadata that we have about it. But it's quite clear when one reads this that, that FAIR is independent of any implementation that you might use, right? These are, these are uh, high-level principles that are meant to be um, aspired to. They are not a specific uh, representation. FAIR is also not equal to open. So FAIR actually makes no statement about whether the data are open or closed. They're just saying uh, this is just something that you, the way you're building your resources, they should allow open science. This is a bedrock of open science. But um, it doesn't require that, for example, sensitive data be open. It allows for authorization, right? It promotes it, but it doesn't require it. And as I just mentioned, it's really not for life sciences. There's groups around the world, geosciences, other places that are all coming together around FAIR. And what does that mean? Uh, uh, to them. And so uh, I made this slide because uh, we hear this all the time saying we don't want to reinvent the wheel and then we go ahead and reinvent the wheel. And uh, one of the reasons that I think Force 11 in particular uh, started to issue principles rather than implementations was because we're in a very uh, rapid technological uh, time of technological flux. Things change underneath it. And so I made this slide once on a joke when I say, well, we reinvent the wheel all the time because we have to. We have new materials, we have new technologies, we have new tooling, we have all kinds of things that allow us to uh, recreate things in more productive ways. But we haven't changed the principles of the wheel, right? That it's round, it, uh, it needs to fit into something else, it, it is propelled by force. Um, and so all of our all of our wheels have to conform to certain basic principles of what a wheel is. So we really think that principles provide aspirations and guidance while still respecting local needs and constraints that you see across the diversity of biomedicine. So as you'll see, there's a lot of um, leeway that is devolved to individual communities of biomedical scientists to interpret this in a way that makes sense for them. And no other field can do that because they don't know the data well enough. They don't understand you know, what your constraints are. That's one of the reasons FAIR was issued as principles, but I think it's a very powerful uh, concept. So let's take a closer look at FAIR. Uh, this was a nice quote uh, that um, I found. It's a, this guy was one of the first motivational speakers way back when, and he said, so many fail because they don't get started, they don't go, they don't overcome inertia, and they don't begin. And I can't tell you the number of large consortia projects that I've been involved in, where everyone's like, we need standards, we need this, we need this. And then after the first you know, five, six, seven months of people working together, they just say, oh, forget it. Let's just do whatever we want, and we'll fix it after the fact. Um, and uh, I might have time for a little anecdote later, uh, because I'm going to talk a little bit about the INCF uh, standards process that, uh, that we've put in place. But I can honestly say that on my last uh, consortia, when they said, that I'm like, nope, stop. <laughs> we do have standards. We do have things that you can use. They're not perfect, but if we don't start using them, they will never get to be perfect. So I think it's really important that we start to work towards FAIR, even though FAIR is largely aspirational and nobody can achieve it fully at this point. <laughs> 
So if you actually read the FAIR paper, everybody knows the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. They can recite it in their sleep. But actually, there are about 15 attributes, I think I counted correctly, that go under each of these headings that give some recommendations of things that should be achieved in order to promote whatever uh, the uh, letter is. And you're not expected to read this, because I'll have them all in order. But what I thought I would do is actually go through a couple of these, not all of them, because uh, that would be really tedious, and show you what that actually means in practice and some of the ways that FAIR is being implemented. So we'll start with findable. Findable, of course, is the most important thing. That was NIF's number one rule. If you can't find it, well, then what good is it, right? <laughs> you basically have to be able to find it. And I put a little note down here uh, that says hacking culture needs to meet library culture. Because one of the things I learned in Force 11 with uh, hanging out with the libraries and the publishers, and again, I will re reiterate this point over and over again. The hacking culture stands things up, they hack a bit, and they move away. And therefore, the entire biomedical landscape is littered with these little products that nobody knows what they are, nobody can find them because the links break and all kinds of things like that. And research needs to maintain a hacking culture, right? We're researchers, we have to be able to do this. But scholarship demands more stability than that, and that's what libraries traditionally have done, right? They've said, I've got to be able to find this, not just now, but 100 years in the future. And what do I do with it? How do I store it? Publishers very much rely on making sure that links are stable and other things so that people can find it. And what I found is that there's this interesting merging of these two cultures here. And as with any type of merging, you know, it's not always uh, easy, right? And there's a lot of large gaps of understanding that actually have to be crossed. But in my view, the library scientists need to understand that these are not dead artifacts like a paper, but often involved in active use, active development. They need to be able to compute on. So there's a lot of dynamism associated with these data artifacts that has been difficult for them to deal with in their, let's put the book on the shelf, right, and slap some metadata on it. At the same time, as I said, the sort of hacker, researcher, computer scientist culture that says, great, I can do this, write my conference paper, and then move on, doesn't work either, right? There's a merging that has to happen between these two cultures. So um, I just want you to keep that in mind. So if we look deeply into what findable means, you can see that there's four principles. And number one is data or metadata, and we'll describe what that is in just a moment, are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. They are described with rich metadata which loosely translated is data about data. They clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data it describes, and they're registered or indexed in a searchable research source. So everybody says, oh, well, Google, Google does this, right? You don't need to do it. But Google has been terrible at data resources because data are often contained in structures that don't allow themselves to be easily searched by search engines. Many of you, if you search for a movie, for example, you now see structured data on the side. Uh, that's uh, Google's recognition that until people actually start to build things so that they can consume it, we don't really have a large index. But basically, the two that are bold are the ones that I'm going to talk a little bit about more, but clearly at 4 o'clock. If you have other questions, I will answer them for you. So the first one is that metadata or data are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. What that means is that every artifact has a, a identifier that is not used anywhere else in the world. As we'll see, generally those identifiers um, are resolvable. That is, if you use the appropriate service, you can be taken to that artifact. Some examples you've already heard. You've heard about DOIs, or digital object identifiers, which largely came out of the publishing industry. But also there are things like uh, ORCIDs, which identify individual researchers. How many people here have their ORCIDs? Very good. If you haven't raised your hand, I suggest you go to ORCID and obtain this for you, right? Because while there might be Actually, there are 11 Marianne Martones in the world, right? There's only one that have my unique identifier <laughs> and my profile, okay? A lot of biomedical databases use accession numbers. And accession numbers, as we'll see in a moment, need not be globally unique and usually aren't. And they're certainly generally not uh, resolvable, right? So they don't really meet the criteria. But this has been the predominant tradition inside of biomedicine. Um, the other thing about it is that, whoops. 
they are issued by registries who track and identify and ensure that uniqueness is maintained. So as I often say about uh, global unique identifiers, this is a social contract. There's nothing magical about a DOI. If there's no organization that stands behind its uh, uniqueness to know that it has not been reused by something else like the internet registries, and that in fact it reliably resolves when the underlying URL structure changes, then they break just as well as anything else, right? So it's really a social contract, not some magic technology. But why is there all this fuss about identifiers? In fact, Pitapalooza is the festival of persistent identifiers. Every year, everybody gets together and they talk about persistent identifiers. Uh, I went to one of these in a, in a town in um, Spain, which was lovely, but you're like, wow, that's a lot of time and effort to just talk about these numbers. But you can see uh, there's an initiative called Go Fair, which has some very nice explanatory materials. And it says pr principle F1 is arguably the most important because it will be hard to achieve other aspects of FAIR without globally unique and persistent identifiers. Hence, compliance with F1 will already take you a long way towards publishing FAIR data. Again, globally unique means it's unique in the world. So uh, this is an example right here of, for example, an accession number. Let's see if we can get this to work. And this is an accession number um, for you know, the PubMed ID for this particular paper about RRIDs. And you can see I pull up all kinds of things, security bank, glossary services, and whatever. It's unique within PubMed, but it's not unique across the world, OK? Oops, I have to go back. There we go. So the other thing about it is that it's stable and persistent. And as I mentioned before, it's stable and persistent because if you use the DOI, then you take on the burden to say, if I change my underlying URL structure, I will let you know such that this will always resol reliably resolve regardless of what URL structure I use. Everybody knows about link rot from the early days of the web. In fact, DOIs were the publisher's way of saying we cannot have link rot. We cannot have broken URLs because that just breaks the whole concept of being able to stably reference. So basically, um, if you use something called a DOI, you are agreeing that you will not allow that to break. They can be resolvable. They don't need to be resolvable that they can. So there's a difference between a PubMed ID and this number where I might pop it into a search bar and come up with uh, not just the object that I'm looking for, but also anything else that may reference this paper, right? It doesn't, you know, the, the first one happens to be the paper, but if you've referenced it, it shows up. Anytime anybody uses that number, it will show up. But when I use a resolver service, what that means is it's going to take me to that and only that, okay? So it takes me to, in this case, a PubMed, and it takes me to some descriptive information that says this is the article that you're looking at. So there's actually a lot of infrastructure, science, and social contracts involved in these persistent identifiers, which is why they get their own uh, particular conference and why we spend so much time on them. Oops. What happened? Oh no, did it go away? Did I close it? That would be terrible. Yes, okay. Neurohack, sorry about that. I violated my own rule of no live demos. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a second thing that's really important about these. And you saw that, that when I was taken to that PubMed record, I wasn't just taken to the entire article. The very first thing I was taken to was a landing page that provided basic descriptions of what it is that this object was. And it told me things like, where can I go and get it? What access rights do you have? Um, you know, it told me about its identifiers. It told me about its authors. And that's the other powerful thing about um, these persistent identifiers is they become little hubs and nodes to be able to aggregate information about that object. That's what I'm going to refer to as metadata, right? It's information about that object. And I now have them all bundled in one place because all of these things point to that same identifier. So that brings us to number two, which is data should be described with rich metadata. Now, rich is an undefined term. Okay. Many people say, what does this constitute? But there's a lot of um, work that's gone on that says these are basic attributes about a data set, just like we have basic attributes about a research paper. So I actually got this from um, one of uh, the uh, original 
repositories online for neuroimaging data. And this is a fairly old set. And if you go to the landing page, it says family, phantom DICOM data. And then it says subject one, two, and three. And you can see it really has very little else. You know, I don't know what this is. I don't know how it was done. I don't know if I don't know what a phantom is. I don't have any idea what this is. Now, it turns out if you dig deeper and deeper and deeper, you can find that. But early on, it was just a, a stretch to even get things onto the web, and we really didn't pay attention to consistent metadata. Fast forward to Open Neuro. I used Russ's uh, <laughs> example here. And here you can see a page. It has a title like you would expect in an article. It has descriptions. It tells you something about the data. It tells you something about why the data were acquired. And if we start to look across all of these different repositories, not just in, in neuroscience but in other fields, you can see that people are kind of uh, you know, converging towards what are the basic things that you should know about a data set that would help us in search and also help us understand that if we, if we were taken to that thing, understand what that object is and how we can use it. So a meaningful title and description, including the study purpose, techniques, contributors, the full citation to support data citation, instructions on use, clear information about versioning, access rights, right? What license do I use to be able to access this? And subjects and other attributes. And we kind of got so tired of um, people saying, well, what is rich metadata? I'm going to make the same mistake I did before. Then in another project we're at, we just said, you know what? We're just going to tell people. <laughs> this is what we mean by rich metadata. And you can see here, if you can read this, that a lot of it is just basic things that you would see in any authored object. Who are the authors? Who did this? Who did that? But in biomedicine, we want to know the study organism, the condition study, the number of subjects, the protocol type, the sex of the studies, and keywords. Now the careful thing about uh, uh, F1 or F2 is that if you start to create pages and pages and pages and pages of it, nobody's going to do it. So we're trying to keep it to a reasonable number of attributes. But in fact, if you look across all of the different projects that are involved in this, you will see that, in fact, it's very consistent across different projects. These are the types of information that people find. So I think I already gave you the definition of metadata, but there it is. So let's look a little bit at accessible. Right? Metadata are retrievable by their identifier using a standardized protocol. So basically, if I resolve that thing, it's going to take me to the object. In fact, if you've seen, best practice basically says you should not resolve directly to the data, but you should resolve to a landing page that tells you about the data. And that's simply because just going to see raw data without this kind of context makes it extraordinarily difficult. But the other thing that um, having a landing page uh, allows you to achieve is that you'll see in A2 here, metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. Sometimes there are good reasons for you to take a data set down. Just like sometimes articles are retracted and sometimes books go out of print, right? We don't keep everything forever. But if we have a landing page, we can basically have a sign that says, this data are no longer available for this reason. The scholarly web doesn't break. There's no uh, breaking of the chain. So it turns out these landing pages are very useful and versatile things. And because of that, the recommendation if you're building repositories is that you should have one of these for, in fact, a data set. And that's just illustrated here in the next uh, slide, right? You can see that what we're really proposing is that we're linking digital objects. It could be my profile, my data, my code, my research resources, different articles. And when we have a link that breaks, the scholarly web breaks itself. And that's really what these PIDs and rich metadata are supposed to allow us to avoid and why fair principles say, even if your data has to go, you should tell us why it went away. And if this has been referenced in an article or another database, when you go to there, it's not a 404 error. It's a, this is why this was taken down. So very, very important. Interoperability is probably one of the hardest things to achieve and one of the things that, of course, we all salivate over because the ideal thing is I can take your data over here and your data over here and somehow plug them together and be able to use them in a harmonious fashion. When we were doing the neuroscience information framework, we found that the use of multiple different vocabularies, abbreviations, symbols, were one of the single largest things that prevented us from reasonably finding things and understanding what it was when we actually found it. <laughs> 
And so the one that I'm going to focus on here is that metadata should use vocabularies that themselves follow the FAIR principles. This is just an example that actually came from NIF. I one time looked to see how many ways the anterior cingulate cortex was referred to in all of the databases that NIF's queries. Basically, every variant you could think of was used somewhere. Some of them had brackets, curly cues, other sorts of things that made it difficult. We had various abbreviations. We had Broadman's areas. This one didn't have spaces in between them, right? All of these make it extraordinarily difficult to find things in the first place because you have to be able to search across any custom uh, way that somebody might refer to it. But it also basically makes it difficult to link these to other things because you spend so much time trying to find them in the first place and you don't know what the relationship is between anterior cingulate cortex and something else. So the idea uh, in FAIR is that if you look in things that are like formal oncologies which help make these FAIR, each one of these has its own PID. So each concept has its own PID. If you use those PIDs inside of databases, just like with PubMed IDs or my ORCID IDs, it helps to disambiguate. The thing that really seems to bother scientists is that, well, how do I know that your definition of anterior cingulate cortex is the same as yours? And in fact, I used to say, hum and haw and go, well, well, well. And I'm like, well, right now you don't. But you can't even find all the places that people assert that they're talking about the anterior cingulate cortex. You cannot get the data in order for you to even tell what their definition is. So this is a first step. And I think if you think about these as assertions, I am saying that this data has something to do with the anterior cingulate cortex, then it becomes a lot easier to take because, in fact, as we know, if you do the careful alignments, the definitions get fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier until you wonder whether there even is any validity to something like the anterior cingulate cortex, right? So you always have to look at these things not from, I'm a scientist, as I think Russ said, and I know better than everybody else what this thing should be, to if somebody else wanted to find my data and I said it was about the anterior cingulate cortex, I should make it easier for them, right? And when I get there, I should find FAIR data so that I can actually compare the two. So FAIR vocabularies are extremely important. They also give us some additional benefits in the sense that um, they provide richer context through these qualified relationships. That means I could have something here where I have cerebral subcortex and I could say that that was a part of brain. And generally, these things are called ontologies. There are a lot of examples out there. You may know the gene ontology. It's the best known one, foundational model of anatomy, which was created here at the uh, University of Washington. But I will tell you, as somebody who's been trying to develop these and figure out the way to do it for neuroscience, building and developing for neuroscience has been a real challenge, just because we're dealing with this legacy of all of these different terminologies, all these different atlases, all of these different uh, parcellation schemes, some of them in papers, some in people's heads, some of them in atlases. And therefore, it really is going to require an act of will, if you ask me, on behalf of the neuroscience community, to start thinking about these vocabularies differently and start thinking differently about how they even create them. Okay, I would say that one place where neuroscience really differs uh, from FAIR is that we do a lot with spatial registration and common coordinate systems. And those, of course, allow us to at least somewhat to, to uh, by, you know, step uh, bypass the problems dealing with vocabularies. But even then, we still use labels that we talk about. So I would say vocabularies, again, is still an opening challenge, although we've been trying mightily. So I think you'll probably hear from Satra and others um, about some of the work that's going on in a project called Repronym to really develop some of these vocabularies for uh, neuroimaging. And you can see it's not a trivial thing, right? Because we have something called the caudate nucleus, which is a real structure, uh, or right here is a real structure. This is the sort of platonic one. We have the caudate nucleus that Free Surfer talks about, right? We have left and right. We have the caudate nucleus that the Atlas talks about. And this type of reconciliation is extraordinarily difficult, time consuming, and slow. Um, but I think we're starting finally to make some progress on how it is that we can sort of handle these complexities. And one of those is to be very clear that the conceptual thing that we talk about, that, you know, that the head of the caudate nucleus and the thing that free surfers measures are related, but they are not the same. Right? One is a data element that has volumes, that has boundaries, that has all of this, and the other is the thing we talk about. Right? It's a platonic caudate nucleus, and we don't really know what you mean until you provide us some data where you tell us what it means. Reusable. 
So metadata are richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. You notice this is different than rich metadata. It says, actually, that's great for finding it and understanding what you've retrieved, but you need a lot more if you really want to understand what's going on inside of this data. Metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. You would think that that might be obvious, but again, NIF, who's been doing this for years, found at one point that 60% of the data sets had no clear license. They might have terms of use with 50 pages that nobody reads, but there's been a lot of work in the scholarly communications uh, and digital community about licenses, the Creative Commons licenses that you may have seen, CC BY and CC0. And I think there's this very nice quote from Mike Carroll, who does a lot of work on intellectual property. He's a, a lawyer and he says look you may not think it's a big deal but legal uncertainty interferes with the productive reuse of research data a lot of commercial entities for example will not use data that's out there unless you explicitly say you are allowed to use it Wikipedia will not let you put things in unless you release it to the public domain so it's very important to be very clear about what rights you want to assign uh, provenance obviously very very uh, critical and this one here, metadata meet domain relevant community standard. <laughs> okay, again, very fuzzy. What is a domain relevant community standard in neuroimaging? So just to talk about a plurality of relevant attributes, this uh, is from my repernim colleagues and you see uh, the, basically the complexity of the entire workflow, the type of provenance that has to be captured across all of the steps till you finally get things uploaded into a shared database. That's a lot of complexity, that's a lot of metadata that needs to be managed, okay? Um, what is the plurality of relevant attributes? That's turned out to be a moving target and as you may have seen in, the, in David Kennedy's, the repernim paper, Basically, everything you look at seems to have some impact on, whether, you know, on how reliable and reproducible your data are. And I think Russ showed that in a very nice way. Tool selection matters, version matters, statistical models, computational models, you know, environments matter, study population characteristics matter. And in fact, these all matter so much that without tools like GitHub and Docker and the other things that you're going to hear about in some of the tools that are being developed in Repernim and Rust's lab, I don't think we'll ever get there. I think this is the type of thing that simply requires computational support that captures as you're doing these things a lot of the critical steps because it is too much for a human to sort of manually write down. We tend to be very, very poor at that. And that's what the uh, Repernim Center led by David Kennedy, uh, the centers that Russ has also mentioned are really geared towards is what, what do we do? How do we make uh, neuroimaging more uh, reproducible? Um, and again, uh, this is another example of something called the neuroimaging uh, data model. And you can see that it has experiment, it has workflow, it has results. It basically uh, uses formal vocabularies um, that help to capture some of this provenance. And I'm pretty sure that Satra will talk a little bit about this when he uh, talks later on in the week. The last one I want to talk about is relevant community standards, okay? <laughs> and this one is kind of an interesting thing, and it brings us to what I call the human infrastructure for FAIR, right? When they say community, Neuroimaging actually seems to have a community that's fairly well defined. You have your own meetings, right? You have your own journals, and you're like, we, you, you come through a few different labs, and there's the brotherhood, sisterhood of, of neuroimaging. Um, a lot of other places, it's a lot less fuzzy, it's a lot more fuzzy, and they tend not to have the community infrastructure in order to be able to bring different people together. There's the Society for Neuroscience, but that's a huge, gigantic thing that brings the entire neuroscience community together. But, you know, often, again, these smaller communities communities have a hard time. Um, so uh, the reason that we know that standards are so important and certainly so important for neuroimaging data, and this has already been covered, is that neuroimaging experiments are complicated. They can be organized in many different ways. There's many different files, file types per subject. We've been doing some work as part of one of the consortium I mentioned, and sometimes there are thousands of files that are produced, and the people doing the infrastructure were completely taken back by that because they're used to one gigantic file being deposited, right? But this characterizes neuroimaging. Members of the same lab may use different ways to arrange data. This all leads to difficulty sharing data across large-scale projects, but oftentimes even within, large, within your own project, right? Graduate student A, graduate student B, we've already uh, heard about that. 
So it's really important that we build on these standards, that we have these standards. And as Russ also indicated, if we have these, it makes it a lot easier to build stable and robust and good tools on top of it, because you're not dealing with a, a moving target or an N of one, right? It, it allows this whole ecosystem actually to start to come into existence. But what is a community standard and which community standard, right? You've all seen this cartoon. There are 14 competing standards. Ridiculous, we need to develop one universal standard. Situation, there are 15 competing standards. And we already have heard you know, some of these. We have BIDS, we have DICOM, we have NIFTY, we have NIDEM, we have NICS, we have NDA. We have all of these different standards because First of all, letting a thousand flowers bloom is the way a field comes into existence, right? When we all started, there was nothing, and so we all tended to develop our own. But also, and this is an interesting observation that I've made, and I recently heard Phil Bourne, who uh, was the Associate Director for Data Science at NIH, make the same observation. For us, neuroinformatics is not just a neutral thing, right? This is our careers. These are the things we get built on. These are the grants that we get. And in biomedicine or any place else, just like a research grant, right, we pounce on other things and we say, you know what, this one does nine out of the ten things, but of course I need that tenth thing, and so I'm going to build another one. And the study section is like, oh yeah, you know, they probably do need that tenth thing, so let me go ahead and, and, and give them more money. Or they didn't even know that the other standards existed in the first place, right, because the three people who are, reviewed your grant had no idea what was going on. So there's a lot of reasons for proliferation of these things. Um, but I think this sense of ownership and that, in fact, when you don't use my standard, it's a personal affront to me as a researcher, right, because I put my heart and soul in this, and this is my research project. There's a lot of sense of um, personal investment in these things, and really they should be neutral, right? <laughs> They're just a file format. They're just a data format, right? They, they really shouldn't, uh, your career shouldn't be dependent on them, but that's the way we fund things, and they are, right? So there's a, there's a lot of attachment to them. And in other areas, engineering, the web, where you need um, really robust standards and harmonious standards, they have something called a standards organization, right, that allows these sorts of things to happen. The W3C is one of them, IEEE is another. So we thought, you know, we ought to really have one of these for neuroscience. And there was an organization, which um, you may have seen logos on there, called the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, INCF, which was founded back in 2006 for the purpose of trying to figure out how we should be able to exchange neuroscience data with one another. And again, we went through the early phases of people saying, my standard, my standard, my standard, my standard. Also, INCF said, well, until we invent that 15th standard that goes over everything else, right, we can't possibly use what was out there. Um, but recently, we've realigned the organization and developed a new uh, procedure for INCF to consider standards. Those standards no longer have to be invented here, so NIH, but rather, I think it's called uh, PI. PIE, proudly invented elsewhere, right? These standards are whatever exists out there, whatever is useful. But what INCF will do is review, review them against a set of criteria, make sure that they adhere to best practices, make sure that documentation is clear, make sure that they are actually used by people other than those who invented them, and to try to bring some um, clarity and help to those who are seeking to do the right thing by using these standards. So uh, these are the endorsement criteria. There's open, right, which we said is different than fair. How much do these support open science? How much do they uh, support fair? How much do they support formal provenance, data citation, right? Do we know who created these things? Uh, can we give them credit? Has to have relevant tooling and implementations. At least some associated tools must be open. Needs to have clear governance. How are decisions made, right? If uh, you have an argument, how are disagreements uh, resolved? Uh, documentation and training materials, means for maintenance and long-term sustainability, which is a long issue. You don't want to invest in something if it's going to be gone tomorrow. And clear evidence and adoption of use outside of those who develop it. So this standards and best practices um, process is really directed not towards the people who develop these things, but to the rest of the community who actually needs to use them, and that's what the committee takes as their charge. So a paper was uh, written and uh, posted in uh, OSF if you're interested in reading about it. But this also allows INCF really to help promote the adoption of these things. So we created our Endorsed by INCF badge. Um, INCF is developing a lot of training materials, courses, and workshops. These, these standards will be featured in those so that they can be promoted. And again, uh, 
uh, INCF has working groups and seed funding so that if an extensions have to be done or people want to work on harmonization, they can go ahead and do so. So there's a lot of support there for it. And BIDS, uh, congratulations to Russ and Chris, was actually the first uh, standard to go through the INCF endorsement process. And the reason why I thought this was interesting, I mentioned before that there was a project that was getting going. It's actually not a primarily a neuroimaging project, but it had some of it in there. And that's when they said, you know what, I've given up on standards. Let's just put all the data in there, complicated thousands of files, and a README file. And we're like, no, 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 no. We, I had just undergone the endorsement process for bids, and because I had done that, I was confident that, in fact, you could rely on bids, that it was supported, that there were enough implementations that were out there that you could reliably say, yes, this has been used, this can be used. It had forums, it had good documentation, it had training, no governance, but that's okay, right? You know, nobody is perfect, uh, and you know, that, that I think caused them to sort of think about this question and say, how should this be governed? But it turned out that this endorsement process, not, you know, the bids people were very confident in it, but it actually gave confidence to people outside of bids to say, you know what, you really should look at this and you can build a project on top of it, which I think is very important. So the other thing that uh, INCF is doing is we know that there are competing standards. You know, is it bids? Is it an IDM? Is it all of this? And again, our goal is to say, if these are complementary, let's give help to people to say which one do I choose and under what circumstances so that there are pages there to uh, help people choose appropriate ones, but also to make sure that they themselves can come together around uh, harmonization. The other thing that the SBP process did was put a grievance procedure in. So if one uh, person feels that their you know, standard was not considered appropriately, they have somebody to complain to. Because as I mentioned, these are not neutral things in most cases. They are intellectual products that people very much take ownership of. So basically, if you follow all 15 of these things, voila, right? <laughs> You've basically produced a fair data object. It's got core bits of data. It's got the right identifiers. It's got standard and code. And it's got metadata. Easy, right? Well, of course, I'm sure most people right now are looking at this, and most people, when they bother to go beyond the findable, accessible, and interoperable, and reusable, go, gee, I don't really know. I don't know what to do. And I think I just want to end on this to say that um, I very much view FAIR as a partnership. I, it involves researchers, repositories and registries, indexers and aggregators like NIF and, and Google and community organizations that help support the human aspects of FAIR. If there is a community, where are the conveners? Who speaks for the community? How is all of this determined? But the good news is, as a researcher, if you actually look at most of the requirements for FAIR, the burden actually falls on the repositories. Repositories really are these new entities that have come up, right? These were the things that NIF was charged with cataloging. And I view them as the publishers for data, right? We have publishers for, for articles. There are publishers for data. Well, why do you submit something to a publisher? We all grumble about it, right? We all grumble about all of this. But in addition to doing peer review, they make sure that the appropriate metadata is there. They make sure that the metadata is tagged, right? They make sure that this goes into PubMed. They make sure that uh, um, the references are in the correct format, right? There's a lot of curation and work that goes on. They make sure that in case of nuclear disaster, these digital articles still exist, right? So they steward them for you using specialized infrastructures that are available for that. So publishers do a lot more than simply charge you money or you know your library subscription fees and run peer review. They actually ensure, again, the stability of these artifacts now. That wasn't always the case. The library traditionally had done that. But in the digital world, it is often the publishers who are responsible for a lot of these things. So as I always say to people, the number one thing that you, as a researcher, can do to ensure FAIR is to submit to a repository that supports FAIR because that is what's going to allow you to get the biggest bang for the buck. However, you do have to use good data management because it's a lot harder to produce all of this rich metadata and plurality of attributes and everything after the fact than it is if you're using good data management practices in the lab. And those of you saw the recent study by Van Gulik and Borgi, it's not uh, pervasive in neuroimaging. It's not pervasive anywhere, OK? <laughs> right now, our laboratories are, are very primitive in terms of their IT. Um, you have to do some things to prepare to share. There's a lot of reasons why people can't share data. One of the biggest ones is they never got permissions from their colleague, their advisor, or anybody else to say that I'm going to sort of share this down the line. Um, 
adopting and aligning to standards before you do it is a lot easier than after the fact. So knowing that this is what you're going to have to do actually makes it a lot better. And I think the interesting thing about what's being asked here for FAIR is nothing that we're asking you to do here is bad for you or bad for your science. I don't know anybody who's ever said, gee, I wish I hadn't annotated that data so much. I've often regretted not annotating at all, right? I don't think anybody does that. So I think it's really important to recognize that FAIR, even though it seems like a lot of work, is actually good and, and resonant with good scientific practice. Okay, but it's the repositories who deal with persistent identifiers. You don't. Machine-based access, making sure the licenses are there. Support for open domain specific standards. Machine readable metadata. Future friendly formats. That's one of the biggest things is we use proprietary formats, but down the line 10, 15 years from now, is anybody going to be able to read that, right? That's a very important thing. So a lot of the burden falls on the repository. And there are a lot of them for uh, neuroimaging. Uh, open Neuro, uh, Russ already mentioned, uh, is, is getting a lot of traction, but Nitric, NeuroVault, NIMH Data Archive, institutional repositories. If you haven't uh, looked at your own campus to see what the libraries have for you, you should, because often they will host data as you're producing it, and they'll give you help with data management. Very important, okay? And also down the pipe, I think NIH is starting to get more serious <laughs> about data sharing and standards. So this was the uh, BRAIN initiative a policy that was issued in January, and you'll notice it says uh, you will put it into an archive, <laughs> and they give you the archives you're allowed to put it in. Um, you will describe in your data management plan the standards that are going to be used to describe the data, and you're going to tell us the proposed timeline for submitting data to the archive and sharing the data with the research community. So so this has been one of the most uh, prescriptive policies that we've seen, but all the rumblings out of NIH suggest that all of NIH is going this way. So whether we want to do it or not, <laughs> I think it's coming down the pipe. And as I mentioned, it's good for you, and I think it's also good for science. So just to sort of finish up, FAIR is principles which means, again, there's a lot of leeway, but it's also aspirational. Nobody thinks that out of the box you're going to all be miraculously fair. Nobody built the perfect repository someplace that, that adheres to everything. And so there are things that are absolutely basic, metadata and PIDs and access that everybody should be adhering to. And then as communities come together to interpret what fair means to them, these things start to get implemented over time and these things tend to become more useful. But this is a joint exercise. It really is a community exercise. And just to put a plug in, since Russ put his book, uh, we have introduced a new journal called NeuroCommons, which is really designed around how you build open, fair, and citable research objects. It's not something that we know. It's something we all have to learn. And when that happens, you typically create a journal to say, let's start to gather all of this material. Let's have a focus for this. So uh, Satra and myself are editors, and many of you are on the editorial board already. So just to summarize, Fair data principles give us guidance on how to prepare data for maximal utility to us and to others. I think future you is a really important person to be designing these things for. And you as a graduate student and a postdoc say, I've got two years, I've got four years to do this. So you may not care, but your PI does care. A lot of senior PIs have come to me and said, I have lost control of my laboratory. I don't know where anything is anymore. Whereas before, I had a giant cardboard box and it said Russ on it. So right, you knew exactly what it was. right? But that day, that day is over. FAIR requires technical, but also human infrastructure throughout the data life cycle. FAIR really begins with the researcher, although the researcher at some point hands over responsibility for a lot of this to the repositories. It is always good practice to add rich metadata to all research objects, whether this is in GitHub, whether it's your code snippet or whatever. Who created this, right? When did I create it? What did I create it for? All of those things are always useful things to have. I, uh, as I said in another talk, I have my old electron micrograph back when we used film, never regretted annotating too much, always regretted not annotating, right? It's good to participate in this human infrastructure. We were talking at lunch how difficult it is. These committees are hard. The time frame is hard. But it's through this consensus, these interactions, these networks that we learn how to do things better. And I think, in truth, the more we practice FAIR, the easier it will get. Because with data, there's a lot of software right, that needs to be developed. And when these software tools are developed, when these things become easier, it will become easier for us. I was joking that we haven't yet gotten a bot to write our papers. And someone said, well, in some cases, 
experiences people have. But with data, right, we can in fact offload a lot of the work to automated tools, but we can't do that unless we start to agree around some tractable sets of standards and best practices. Once we do that, the support can follow. And that's it. Here's some useful references for you. And I'm done. And we have five minutes left. <laughs> Office hours. Any questions? No. You get five minutes to transfer. <laughs> oh, there's one. Yes. Yes. So I don't know of anybody who's doing ontology work now who is not using some sort of NLP or something to help pull those concepts out. But the problem with that is it's very poor yet in developing relationships between them. So I would say um, you know, we are in the age of assisted curation of these things, but we're not there in fully automated, uh, you know, fully automated uh, routines. The good news is is that because we have these ontologies, the NLP gets better. They're really useful you know, training artifacts, and any field that does not have one starts way behind than if you do actually have these. So they go hand in hand. But there's been a fantasy of many different groups to say, oh no, I can just pull this out. And that's generally, again, a graduate student thesis, and you haven't gone deeply into right, how these artifacts are being used and what they're going to be used for. It's incredibly difficult. Um, and one of the reasons that I tend to back off to, uh, fully from semantics is that those semantics are very personal you know you can call the relationship between this and this many many different things but those concepts right the anterior cingulate those the fact that there's synonyms to them and that we at least say this is a part of brain right nucleus as an atom nucleus of an idea a nucleus of a brain right <laughs> you know nucleus of um, uh, whatever the last one is um, those are all different but easily disambiguated. So I say, you know, these, these sort of groups of, of in, in semantically enhanced control vocabularies is a good place to start. Any other questions? Okay, well then, thank you. <laughs>